Good morning, guys. Greetings in the name of Jesus Christ. How are you all doing? <clears throat> saw some interesting news articles last night that kind of got me wondering. And I saw one this morning, too. Certain meetings of certain individuals that are happening over in the Middle East. And our president has gone over there to meet with Israel and a few others. And... I don't know if it's going to happen or not, but I would not be surprised if they try to assassinate him. I was reading the article and it dawned on me, wow, what an opportunity they would have. I, I wonder if that's going to happen. Because immediately I started to think about stuff in book, book Revelation, Daniel 8, and a few others. And I thought, oh, man, if they take him out, because he has a pretty large group of people that go with him, everybody's going to get taken out. Wow. The world's changing so fast. So fast. Um, they're having a big meeting in Turkey with Russia and a few others. There's an old prophecy from a rabbi that says whenever Russia is in Istanbul, um, the Messiah is about to appear, and that looks like that's about to happen. A lot of stuff. A lot of stuff changing fast. And then that, that's not even... Considering the stuff going on above us. <clears throat> got an asteroid heading straight at us. Got a giant comet passing us up. It's just non-stop stuff. Non-stop. Just seems like there's no end to the news. And it's just every... Well, now it seems like it's about every 30 minutes. Something new's coming out. Incredible. With all that going on, with all the distractions that we have in our life, I have them too. What should we be focusing on? What should we be looking to? What questions should we be asking ourselves and others? Let's go into Jonah 4.9. God said to Jonah, Dost thou well to be angry? Okay. So let's go into that verse. That whole verse says, Then God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the planet? And he said, It is right for me to be angry, even to death. So Jonah was angry, but what was he angry about? See, he was looking at all the situation that was going on in front of him. An entire city, a city that took three days to walk across. It's a big city. Nineveh's huge. Three days to walk across this city. And God was about to wipe this entire city, city out. He's about to destroy, destroy everybody. Man, woman, child, animal. Everybody. And Jonah could see this. But he became very selfish and started to focus on his selfishness. Focus on what made him happy. There was a little tree, a little bush or something like that. And he went and sat under it because it had shade. Because it was hot that day. And then God took the plan away to, sh to prove a point to him. Let's look at this in context. This is actually a really good event. One, two, three, four, five. I'll just go to the first. Jonah's anger and the Lord's compassion. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. So he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger, and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. What happened here? Why was he so upset? Well, let's back up. Let's go down here. So he preached to them in uh, verse or chapter 3. Verse 10, then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it, because they changed and they repented. Now, later on, Nineveh ended up getting destroyed because they went back to their evil ways. But, <coughs> God paid attention, he saw it. 
we start with chapter four, but that displeased Jonah that it happened. Jonah didn't like him and he wanted them to be destroyed. Well, this is a man of God. Look how God is dealing with him. But it displeased Jonah and it exceedingly, and he became angry. So he prayed to the Lord, Ah, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. He's like, God, you didn't need me to come do this. I already assumed that you were going to do this. I didn't need to preach to them. Verse 3, Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Then the Lord said, it is, is it right for you to be angry? Why are you mad about this, Jonah? Why are you mad because I pulled my hand back from the city? Verse 5, So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city. There he made himself a shelter and sat under it in the shade till he might see what would become of the city. He wanted them to die. He desired that they should be destroyed. He was going to watch and see what happened. Verse 6, and the Lord God prepared a plant and made it cover, uh, come up over Jonah that it might be shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. So God was still showing him mercy, even though he had a lot of anger in his heart. So Jonah was very grateful for the plant. But as morning dawned the next day, God prepared a worm. And so it damaged the plant that it withered. And it happened when the sun rose that God prepared a vehement east wind and the sun beat on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. Then he wished death for himself and said, It is better for me to die than to live. Then God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And he said, Is it right for me to be angry even to death? It is right for me to be angry even to death. Why would you go to your death being angry? Verse 10, But the Lord said, You have had pity on the plant for which you have not labored nor made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left and much livestock? So God is proving a point to Jonah. Is it right? Is it, is it, is it, does this, should you be angry about me relenting on my destruction when there's so much to be lost? But you're upset because this plant was taken out? Jonah was very selfish. God's proving a point to him. He's working on him. He's, he's helping him see the light. Oops. I thought there was more to that. I guess there's no more to Jonah. It goes right into Micah. So you can see what what he was attempting to do here. He's trying to show he's trying to show Jonah what he should he's trying to show Jonah what would be the right response to this. He's trying to, to get Jonah to see the light. You're mad about this plant. First, you're mad that I didn't destroy this city like I said I was going to. You didn't like them. You wanted them to be destroyed. And then you were going to sit here and watch. And so I helped you out, try to relieve your misery a little bit. But then I took the plant away and you got mad at the plant. You're mad at everything. But do you know why you're mad? See, like I mentioned in the beginning of this, what questions should we be asking ourselves? Why are we sad? Why are we upset? Why are we in fear? Why are we angry? We never stop to ask ourselves these questions. This is some of the training that I've gone through in my life. You know, whenever you're doing auto mechanics, you don't ever just start throwing parts at a problem. You sit down and you look at the vehicle, you look at what's wrong and you go, but why is this wrong? Why is there a failure? When I changed the oxygen sensors on my truck here just recently, I had, the truck was act, was actually running bad, which your oxygen sensors have got to be really, really bad to cause that to happen. And I mean, I'm talking bad, bad, and it rarely ever happens. It'll just run a little bit bad, but it was running terrible. 
And I have a code reader, and when I was reading the codes, it was reading a failure on one of them, which is also rare. Usually you'll get a soft code, not a hard code for failure. It's just this one's, this part's malfunctioning. Usually it's the heater element. So I knew something else was wrong here, so I had to ask, but why? So I started at the first one, I checked the wires, everything was fine, changed it. Went to the second one, changed it, everything looked fine. I started working my way back down the wires, I noticed, oh, there's cut wires here. There was damage to the wiring. So I had to ask myself, well, but why are these messed up? I could have just changed them and not even looked at the wiring. But I looked at the wiring and realized there's a problem here. And I found out why the vehicle was running so bad. Those wires were grounding to the metal frame which was causing a short. And it was just enough to cause the vehicle to run bad and create a complete short on one of those oxygen sensors. You don't just start changing parts without asking, but, but why is this happening? There's something going on here. When you're working on um, Volkswagen Passats and Jettas, they have this horrible, horrible problem when you're in the early 2000s of the trans switch going bad on them, which is down on the transmission if they're automatic. And this trans switch links through it, it's super complicated wiring but it links through the traction control and that also connects into the abs brake system so what you'll get is you'll get an error code with an abs light and you go in and run the codes and it'll tell you there's a problem with the abs system but the brakes are working fine and the abs system is working why am i getting that well then it shuts the trash traction control off okay wait a minute if the ABS system is messing up and the traction control shut off, why is it shutting off the traction control? Because the ABS system runs independent of every other system in the car, on every vehicle. It just shares a little bit of wiring, but that's it. But that's an independent system. So why is the traction control being affected? If it would, You would think that if the ABS, which is anti-locking brakes, would fail, you need the traction control to help keep the vehicle under control. So I now have to, have to sit here and think, okay, but why is that happening? Let me do some research. I go and dig it up. Oh, the trans switch runs through that. Oh, go in there, start digging deeper into the codes, find there's a trans switch code in there somewhere. Pull the trans switch off, swap it, put it all back together. Boom, code's clear. Everything's fine. And there are Volkswagens running all over the world that have this problem going in them, but people can't figure it out because they don't ask, but why is this failing? You plant a tree, tree grows. All of a sudden you go outside and you're like, why are all the leaves wilted? Why is this tree dying? And then you gotta investigate and find out. We do the same thing here. Why am I so upset about this event? Jonah never asked himself, why, why am I upset? We never ask ourselves, why do we still have problems? Even though we're saved. We never ask ourselves, why do I care here but not care here you know and when you start to ask yourselves those questions when you start to analyze yourself examine yourself you start to see the reasons why and it causes you to be able to fix a lot of things it causes you to become aware of a lot of things in you and in your life that may be holding you back Why do I struggle so much with getting out of uh, all the problems that I have? Well, maybe it's, maybe there's a, some bad company you're keeping that's causing that problem no more. Because Proverbs talks about bad company ruins good morals. Why do I never seem to get uh, what what other people are getting whenever they pray? You know, it seems like I'm praying for gifts and I don't get any of all this stuff. Maybe you're praying for the wrong thing in the wrong way for the wrong reasons. We never stop and ask ourselves, what is the real reason inside why I desire what I desire or I'm doing what I'm doing? I have to examine my heart and see what the real reason is because that can change my decision making. Jonah was angry for no reason. Why should he care about that whole city and what happens to them? And yet, funny enough, he cared, but he cared the wrong way. He cared because he wanted them to be destroyed instead of caring that it would be better if they were saved. And because of that anger, he became obstinate. He's very selfish. Anger is a good thing. Anger saves a lot of people on both ends. Sometimes being angry can help you keep another person from getting hurt or killed. Sometimes being angry can get you into a situation where you can be hurt or killed. 
and the morning devotion is going to address that. Anger is not always or necessarily sinful, but it has such a tendency to run wild that whenever it displays itself, we should be quick to question its character. Why am I angry? With this inquiry, dost thou well to be angry? Why am I angry? This question, why am I, or why do I, can be applied to almost everything in the Christian life. It may be that we can answer yes. Very frequently, anger is the madman's firebrand. But sometimes it is Elijah's fire from heaven. We do well when we are angry with sin because of the wrong which it commits against our good and gracious God, or with ourselves because we remain so foolish after so much divine instruction, or with others when the sole cause of anger is the evil which they do. I get angry. I get angry at people around me because they know the truth and don't want to receive it, don't want to act on it, don't want to change call me to help them get them out of the situations that they're in when they put themselves in those situations when they didn't take any advice when they didn't listen to professionals I get angry at dumb decisions because uh, we're trying to do this or trying to do that what we have to ask is, is is it right for me to be angry about this situation Sometimes it's not really anger, it's just frustration. I'm frustrated at my wife fighting right now because she's actively trying to buy a house in Colorado. I'm like, we're not in a position to do that right now. But she has what people refer to as wonderlust. You, you, you're not satisfied with your situation and you want to change. The problem is, is when somebody has that, the change is never enough and they're constantly wanting to change. And there's no making them happy. There's no pleasing a person like that. And so I'm, I'm a little angry, but very frustrated with my wife because of what she's doing right now, because we've got things we need to do here. And she's not taking into account just how much it's going to take for us to do this move. I have five vehicles I have to haul on a flat trailer to Colorado one at a time. That's five trips at $5 a gallon. <laughs> that's that's $1,000 to make a trip from here to Colorado. And it, it, it's not the South Colorado, it's in the middle of Colorado. That's not counting everything else. So yeah, there, it, it's okay to be angry. Just be angry for the right reasons. The Bible says be angry, just do not sin. Um, he who is not angry at transgression becomes a partaker in it. This is a very, very important one. Being angry at your sin. I get angry at my sin. I hate it. I hate some of the thoughts that go through my mind. I hate some of the memories that I have. I hate some of the things that I know and I wish I didn't know them. I hate times when I make mistakes. I hate it. It bugs me to no end. To the point that I've gotten so exhausted. I'm, I'm just tired. I don't want to be in this body anymore that has all these issues. We should be angry at our sin. We should hate our sin. That's a mark of sanctification. Sin is a loathsome and hateful thing, and no renewed heart can patiently endure it. God himself is angry with the wicked every day, and it is written in his word, Ye that love the Lord hate evil. Far more frequently it is to be feared that our anger is not commendable or even justifiable. And then we must answer, No. Sometimes we're angry at the wrong things for the wrong reasons. Why should we be fretful with children, passionate with servants, and wrathful with companions? Is such anger honorable to our Christian profession or glorifying to God? Big, big question. What is what I'm doing glorifying God? That will help you understand what emotion you should have or, or whether you should stop with a certain particular emotion. In every instance, it does what I'm doing right now glorify God. Is it not the old evil heart seeking to gain dominion? And should we not resist it with all the might of our newborn nature? Many professors give way to tempter, sorry, to temper, as though it were useless to attempt resistance. But let the believer remember that he must be a conqueror in every point, or else he cannot be crowned. If we cannot control our tempers, 
What has grace done for us? Someone told Mr. J that grace was often grafted on a crab stump. Yes, he said, but the fruit will not be crabs. He's talking about crab apple tree. We must not make natural infirmity an excuse for sin. But we must fly to the cross and pray the Lord to crucify our tempers and renew us in gentleness and meekness after his own image. I'm guilty of this. Everybody is. We struggle with this all the time. But what are we going to do about it? Are we going to get angry and then just say that's good enough? Are we going to present a false anger? I've gone to the Lord in prayer. Lord, I hate that I have this. I hate that this is in me. Why can't this go away? Why can't I get over this? Why can't I conquer this? Those are times when I throw it down at his feet. I don't want this anymore. Sometimes he takes it away. Sometimes he doesn't because I'm still learning stuff. And I need to learn stuff. I still need to learn. So I'm waiting on him to teach me. I'm learning how to resist. I'm learning how to fight. How to change my mind on things. How to push temptation away. Remove temptation. Learning when to speak and when not to speak. When to act and when not to act. When to be angry and when not to be angry. I'm learning in this situation with my wife to not be angry because, number one, I can't change the outcome of any of this. Number two, if it's the Lord's will, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to move. If it's not his will, we won't be able to move. Right now, everything he's doing is, we're not able to. I'm okay with that because I want to be where the Lord wants me to be. I honestly don't know if we have enough time to even bother doing anything anyway. I mean, just being, being real. I'm surprised we got, we've gone this long without annihilating ourselves. But what he's talking about here applies to every situation. Why am I sad about this? What can I do to change it or affect it positively? Why am I upset about this? What can I do to change it positively? Why am I angry about this? What can I do to positively affect the situation? It's part of the self-examination, the sanctification, the change that is within us. Because now we're not just angry for without cause and we don't know why we're angry. And we, we just respond like a child does. But now we stop and think about it. Now we stop and we, we wonder, okay... But why am I so angry? And we make those changes. We humble ourselves if we're in the wrong. We instruct those we're angry at, telling them why we're angry and what we're angry about. Sometimes the anger is justified. When I was doing work for my mom and I would be moving stuff around with moving the, the flat trailers around or, or operating the tractor, they would come up and stand right next to it and I would yell at them. And I finally got so angry because I've seen what happens to people that do that and you, you don't see them and you turn the wheel and the swing of the, of the brush hog or whatever's on the back of the trailer smacks somebody and knocks them down. You know, you people get killed doing that. And finally, I got mad. I shut the tractor off. I took the key out of the ignition. I opened the door. I got out. I threw it at her. And I said, I'm done. You guys do it. And I walked off. What's wrong? What's wrong? And I saw, I laid into all of them. And there was a, a gentleman there that was older than me that knew better. I laid into all of them. I said, you guys are complete idiots. There is something seriously wrong with you. I've told you over and over and over again. I know how to operate equipment, and I also know what happens to people who stand between equipment and a hard surface. You are going to die. Get out of the way and stop walking next to the equipment I'm operating. Stop walking next to the tractor I'm operating. 
if I make a turn and I don't see you, you're going to die. And it just so happened a friend of mine's, uh, uh, one of his family members had had, um, the, the friend was out, everybody was gone at the house. So he went down to the back pasture. He was pushing trees around, moving some dirt around, flattening out with a big uh, bulldozer, had tracked wheels. And he's operating it and he's pushing all this stuff around. Well, um, if you ever, you ever run a, a bulldozer, you can't hear anything. Well, he didn't know that his 14 year old, or no, 16 year old daughter had come home and she was walking down the hill behind him. He didn't, he couldn't see. There's no mirrors on that thing. You don't take the time to stop and look behind you every single time. If you know there's nobody supposed to be there, you do your work. Focus on what's in front of you so you don't break something or hit something or mess something up. He's working and he never heard her. And he ran that track over her body about 16, 17 times before he realized something was something had happened because he happened to look to the side and he saw all the blood. And he got out and realized it was his daughter. He ran right over her and crushed her. So my anger was justified because not only that event, but I have seen other people what happens to them when they... Somebody turns the wheel, they don't see them there, they, the bucket comes across and catches them in the head and, and peels their skull open because the end of it's sharp. Or they get hit in the head, or they get between the wall and the guy's moving the bucket up to load something, they get pinched between, I've seen somebody get pinched between the trailer because they're following the bucket up and the bucket and they're trying to scoop some off the trailer, they don't see the person there and they cut them in half. Or when somebody's towing a flat trailer, or you got a 16 or a 20 foot flat trailer, and they turn the wheel, that trailer swings out the opposite direction that the tractor or the vehicle is turning. Anybody standing there, instant broken leg. So seeing the damage that can happen to a human body when this equipment is hit. So I gave them very clear instructions. Here's what I want you to do. If you need to get my attention, you stand out here in the front and you wave your arms in the air and I'll see you and I'll stop. Do not walk up to the equipment while I'm operating it. So after I jumped up and down hollering and screaming at them, they finally got the message. But they were wondering why I was angry. So I showed them a video. <laughs> I showed them a video of what happened. I said, that was you today. Because the guy was doing the same thing I was doing. I said, that was you today. Luckily for you, I can't trust any of y'all, and I'm constantly watching you guys. And I stopped before it happened. But if I hadn't, have, that would have been you. Because it was her in the tree and the trailer. And that trailer would have mashed her right into that tree. And that would have been the end of it. Sometimes our anger is justified. Sometimes being very angry, it's justified. But we always have to ask, why are we angry? What's the purpose behind we are angry? I was angry at them because I knew what the end result of that type of action was going to be. Sometimes we're angry for no reason. Jonah was angry because a plant went away. Okay, Jonah, well, you had a whole city sitting in front of you. You could have gone and sat in there and gotten some shade. So he didn't have to be angry about the plant. But Jonah was like, yeah, I want to be angry until I die. And God was like, well... should you have been because why are you really angry why are you really mad is it at the city or was it he mad at God because when I read that it tells me that he was mad at God So God did the thing with the plant to prove a point. Who are you mad at and why are you mad? And is it right for you to be mad? And this applies to everything. This applies to everything we see and do and experience in this life. Because we can learn to know ourselves more. 
and to know why these things happen and why we are the way we are and, and, and why we do the things that we do. When we know the why, it helps us to control it better. It helps us to find better ways to glorify Him. People love to get angry at a Christian who chews another person out because they're teaching a false doctrine, but the doctrine is so dangerous it can lead people to death and destruction. And they get mad at the Christian that's angry. But you have to ask, why was that guy angry? They want to accuse him and say, well, you're not showing Christian love. But you didn't ask why he was angry. So now there's a very good reason to be angry. God gets angry. Sometimes there's a very good reason to be sad. Sometimes there's a very good reason to be happy. What God is trying to get us to do is to be thinkers. Think about why. In my life now, I've gotten to the point where when somebody says, well, well, here's, here's the details of the situation. Okay. Okay, let's go do this. Uh, well, hold on a second. I want to know why. Why what? Why we're going to do it that way. Or why this is something that involves me. Or, or why um, we even need to do this at all. You haven't answered those questions. You just said, here's the situation, let's go do it. But you haven't given us any instruction as to what we're doing or how we're going to do it. So I need some why questions answered here because this may be something I can't do or don't want to get involved in. Sometimes that why can save your life. <laughs> Sometimes that why can be the difference between you being successful and failing. Sometimes that why can be you glorifying God or glorifying yourself. Father, we come before you this morning in the name of Jesus Christ to give you praise, honor, and glory, to lift you up and sing praises unto your holy name. Father, we thank you for this word and for this devotion. Father, please teach us to ask why we're mad, why we're sad, why we're happy, why we do what we do, why we can't do what we want to do or, or don't do what we should do, why we struggle, why we constantly fall and make mistakes, why, why things are the way they are. Father, help us to answer those questions so that we can understand more ourselves and why the behavior that exists in us that is there, why we can't stop certain sins, why we can't get certain things under control. <clears throat> We can wear ourselves out with the why. But Father, you ask Jonah this question. Why are you angry? Is it right for you to be angry? You really didn't even ask him why. You just, is it right? Should you be angry right now? But it ended up going into a question of why are you angry, Jonah? What are you angry at or who are you angry at? <clears throat> And you gave him an example. You proved a point. He was mad because the plant was gone. So you're mad about the plant going, but you wanted me to save that plant. But I saved an entire city full of people with over 100,000 people in it. But you were mad about that. So why were you mad? And you got him to change his mind. We should be the same way. And ask why. Not from you, but from us. It's self-examination. Help us to see more and have more insight into why we are the way we are, why we do what we do, why we walk the paths we walk, why we continue to experience the things that we experience, why the world is the way it is. And when we start to ask why, we start to realize why. We start to realize the, the deeper meanings behind things, the deeper intentions behind things, and it causes us to avoid so many of those things. But so many people are trying to change the world and realizing they can't. Because we have to ask, but why am I trying to change the world when this is yours? This is your creation. You have control over it. Instead of me doing that, I should just glorify you in this world. It makes more sense. When those temptations come, we got to ask why. 
Sin is in the flesh. Why can't I overcome this sin? Why can't I overcome this flesh? What's there that's helping me fail? And can I get rid of it? And this is where we come to you in prayer. This is where we come to you and we ask you to show us, to teach us, to strengthen us, to direct our paths. This word, when we read your word, we ask you, Lord, why can't I understand your word? Please give me wisdom. Give me understanding. Show me what it means so that when I know the truth, it's your truth, not man's truth. Why are my family members the way that they are? Why do people treat me so badly? Why, why, why? There's a lot of why questions. Father, teach us to ask the right why questions of the right people so that we can discover the right reasons and end up with the right answer. Is it good for us to be angry? Well, there's opportunities where anger is justified. We always have to ask why. Why am I angry and what am I angry about? And does this anger and the intentions behind it glorify you? And we always have to ask, does this glorify you? It's part of self-examination. A lot of people think this is complicated, but it's not. I've learned that it's not complicated. It can get frustrating because I find a lot of things in me that I didn't understand were there or know that they were there. But it helps me clarify things. It helps me settle things down. And it helps me eat more easily glorify you in what I'm doing. This life is confusing, Father. This life is so backwards from what it should be. And society has gotten so confusing and so backwards and lopsided from what it should be. And sometimes we don't even know what the right question is to ask. We don't know what the right answer is. Sometimes it's just throw our hands up, stand in the corner and just watch it all unfold. Kind of like what Jonah was doing when he went to the city, he preached the word, probably didn't put a whole lot of emotion behind it. But they received the message and they changed and you relented. But then he went and sat down to watch what would happen to the city. It was almost like he was just like, you know what, I, I don't understand anything. He just threw his hands up and said, I give up. I'm just going to sit down here. Better if I just died. I've been there. You remember for a lot of years. And there are times I still wonder, you've given me another focus. You've shown me something different. A different purpose. That I can glorify you in everything that I do. That I can prove the true intentions and the true... Um, what's in the intents of the heart of the people around me, that I can help others understand from a perspective that's uniquely mine. And in some cases, opens up a lot of doors for other people. You've given me a ministry to be able to share that testimony and share those experiences with others so that they can see too, and so that they can, in their own lives, see bits and pieces of the stuff coming from my testimony and help them answer their, those, their, their why questions. Help them understand more why these things are happening and what's going on. And they share theirs and it helps me too. And together we grow. Together we are built up as a church. Together we glorify you. And on this day, Father, we glorify you. Let us not be angry without a cause. And we pray that you are not angry with us without a cause. And if there is a cause, help us to understand the cause on your end or our end, which it, however it's working out, so that we can be productive and find an answer, a solution to the problem that will also glorify you. So that those watching will be blessed. So that those witnessing it can grow too and come to glorify you also. 
How many, how many generations have been wasted because we didn't stop and think before we did anything? Because we didn't stop and think, well, what would God think of this? Because we didn't stop to think, does this glorify you? How many generations have been wasted? Only you know. How many years? Only you know. Father, I know we're going to keep making mistakes. I know we're going to keep stumbling. I know we're going to keep falling short. I know we're going to keep make, you know, I know we're going to keep giving into temptation. I know we're going to keep sinning. So I ask that you help us to overcome these things, to be strengthened through these things, to learn from these things, and to figure out how to identify what these things are, where they're coming from, and how to avoid them, so that we can glorify you in that too. So that we can stop and give thanks. Thanks for the victory. And so that we can match more what your will is for us. So that we can become more of what you desire us to become in this life before we even get to heaven. Now, I don't know what your will is for each and every one of us, but I do know that your will is all men should be saved. And so I pray today, we were all saved. And if we were all saved, then I pray that you mold us and shape us. Like Paul Woodward said, that diamond, getting all those facets being made onto it, being cleaned off and shaped and made into this beautiful jewel. I pray that you keep doing that, making us into that. And I pray that we listen to your instruction. We pay attention to what you're doing. Because that glorifies you. Thank you, Father, for your mercy and grace. Thank you for your great love. Thank you for your free salvation. Thank you for your teaching. Thank you for your correction. Thank you for your chastisement that makes us into those diamonds. In Jesus Christ's name, we bless you, praise you, honor you, and glorify you. And in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Thank you guys for joining me for morning devotion. A little long, but I think it makes the point. I think you guys understand because I know a lot of y'all are in the same position. Wondering the same questions. And we can open this subject up now and realize that really all of us are in the same boat. So let us help each other. Help each other understand what this is and what it means and how can we change it. Jonah probably didn't even really understand fully why he was angry. But God proved a point with him. Jonah, why are you angry at this plant? You were angry at the city. That's a bunch of people. You're angry at this plant. That's nothing. Understand why you're angry, Jonah. Make us and let us glorify God in everything we do. And sometimes that requires you to sit down and go, but why am I doing this? And when you answer that question, it can help you make a better choice and overcome so many things. It's worked for me. Still works for me. Since I have not achieved it yet. Thank you guys for watching. I love you all very much. I bless you all in Jesus' name. And I will see you in the next video.